Our next guest is the talented filmmaker behind films like Baby Driver, Shaun of the Dead, and Hot Fuzz. His debut documentary, The Sparks Brothers, will be in theaters tomorrow. Let's take a look. As a synthesizer duo, I guess you could say that they sort of set a template. I became first aware of Sparks in the 1979 period. Just seeing them on like Top of the Pops around that time, you know, it's a very sort of stark, dynamic image. Russell singing Ron on the Sense. He had his 79 kind of hipster hair. Sparks and the new single called Beat the Cock. Billy. I think it was real great. Please welcome back to the show, Edgar Wright. Edgar, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me back, Seth. It's such a pleasure to see you. Uh, you're in London on a lot of I'm... press for a while. Has been Zoom only, but now there are some in-person events for your documentary. Here's one in L.A. Uh, that you zoom, uh, zoomed into in, in a very, like, 1984 fashion. You really <laughs> kind of took over the room. I... Your American embassy wouldn't grant me a visa waiver to come over and do press because it's non-essential non work doing press. What we're doing right now is not important. Um, but I did, because Ron and Russell from Sparks, they did their first, like, in-person uh, Q and A, and so not to let them down, I did that. I did that Zoom at 5 a.m. London time, but I, I hadn't really factored into the the fact that I was going to be on a cinema screen because nobody needs to see my face that big. I look a bit like Kim Jong Un, <laughs> like threatening to derail the premiere of the interview or something. Uh, I've got, nice. I've got, I was like, look, I've got a Nehru jacket on right now. Now, it's, um, I, I, is it non-essential? Uh, do you think they would have felt the same way if you had, say, directed a Marvel film? Do you think they were uh, specifically knocking you for having directed a documentary? I don't know. Maybe I got demerits just being British. I'm not sure. But, like, um, anyway, I mean, it's, uh, like, I haven't been in the same room as the guy since I shot the movie. So at some point, we'll actually be able to watch the film together. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to be here, of course. As we saw in the clip, not only are you the director of this film, uh, you interview uh, yourself, I guess. You are listed as a fanboy. This is a band uh, that you have loved for a very long time. Uh, that you have you been surprised over the years that more people didn't know them, or is that what you've come to expect? I come to expect it because, as I said in the clip, I was like five years old when I saw them on TV. But in in a pre-internet age, as we remember. Um, <laughs> It was very difficult to get information on bands, like beyond what might be in a magazine or on the radio, on the TV. Before the internet and before Spotify having somebody's entire discography, it was quite difficult to pin bands down. So they were a band that kept coming back into my life. And as that happened more and more frequently, I became more and more obsessed. They went from being a riddle to me to being like a full on obsession. So I think in the last 20 years, I'd become, you know, not just a fan, but you know, that kind of evangelist for the band where you're grabbing anybody <laughs> like within your eye view to say, hey, have you ever heard Sparks? Listen to this. You talk about uh, the technology that wasn't available to us as music fans when we were growing up, but you did use the modern technology of Twitter to make contact with these guys. Well, actually, bizarrely, on, on one of my frequent... Um, marathons of making um, somebody in the same room as me listen to Sparks. <laughs> I, uh, I, I suddenly thought, after having been a big fan of them, I never like, followed them on Twitter. So I, I said, I wonder if Sparks have a Twitter profile. I looked at it and it said, Sparks follows you, which was so shocking to me because, you know, like some artists, they're very en enigmatic, Ron and Russell from Sparks, a bit like Kate Bush or David Bowie. And all of those people, you don't imagine they live on planet Earth. So then I immediately direct messaged them. <laughs> well, first I followed them back. <laughs> and then I direct messaged them and said, is this really the band? I'm such a huge fan. And Russell, the lead singer, messaged me back and said, yeah, we're big fans of your films. And then within, and, and then on top of that, I was in Los Angeles. So then it was the weird thing of like, oh, they're only like 15 minutes drive away. And so within about 32 hours, I was having breakfast with the two of them at their house, which was wild. Now, these guys, as you mentioned, they're so enigmatic, they're so stylized, they're so unique. Were you worried that a lot of people, when they first saw a trailer, would think this was a band you had made up, like, say, Spinal Tap? I mean, 
I think in a weird way, it's a good way to go into the film. I think a lot of people, one thing I want to stress is you do not have to be a fan of the band to enjoy it. And I think in, in a weird way, if you've never heard them before, it's quite a good way to see the movie. And there are definitely some people who saw it at festivals, spent half of the duration thinking, wow, this is like a really elaborate prank. How did he do all this archive? Like it's some kind of Banksy thing. And I was going to say, actually, I wanted to say to you, actually, that I did an article for Rotten Tomatoes the other day where I listed my 10 favorite music documentaries and the top nine were all real. And the number 10 wild card choice was the Blue Jean Committee. <laughs> Gentle and soft documentary now, I'm not kidding. We're very, uh, thank you for uh, putting us in what I'm sure is good company. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, so, I mean, it, it, it is a nice way to see it because I think for a lot of people who watched it and when I was editing the movie, I kept road testing it with friends during the pandemic. And usually I, I sought out friends who'd never heard of them. And they all had the same reaction. They said, it's, it is like sort of what, if you've never heard of them before, it is like watching a secret history of music open up to you. So that's kind of, you know, but they're very real. <laughs> you also must, as a documentary filmmaker, obviously you pick the subject, but you must, as you're putting it together, there's such great archival footage, thanks to the fact that they were so unique. You must fall in love with them as a director in a way that you would also have fallen in love with them as a fan. Yeah, I mean, they're so, I had gotten to know them after the Twitter thing, the sort of, there was a, you know, maybe about two years before I, it occurred to me to make the documentary, I knew what they were like in person. And the thing that I found very endearing about them is that they were never like off the clock. And so there is a thing that I guess, so watching this archive and knowing them, there is this thing where the line between Ron and Russell's brothers and the band is just permanently blurred. And I feel like they, you know, just like a sort of sparks 24 seven. And there's something like really admirable about that because they're the, they're, they are the exception in terms of don't meet your heroes. You know, like they are just like, they're exactly what you want them to be. And the fact that they're sort of so normal makes them kind of even weirder. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, hey, congrats again. It's so wonderful. Uh, and I do hope that we see you again soon over here in the States. Thank you. I'll be back with some essential work. <laughs> that would be not very nice. We would appreciate that. <laughs> the Sparks Brothers in theaters tomorrow. We'll